you all can um, start talking to us immediately. You can interrupt us, uh, criticize us on topics of any, anything you want. We'd much rather have a kind of a scrum, a fist fight, uh, an interaction than we would a uh, panel. But one, two, one, two. Should we just introduce ourselves real quick? Sure. Right now. <clears throat> let, me, let me introduce you, Chris Miller from Ben & Jerry's. I was in New York for the climate march. There were 400,000 people there. And I saw about 150 people in blue Ben & Jerry's shirts. And I said, where's Chris Miller? Is he around anywhere? And they said, no, he's way back there with the giant ice cream cone <laughs> that they had brought. What, what was it made out of? Uh, it was made out of wood and plastic and old red wagons. So standard, incredibly ski, impressive. Jerry yes, rig, absolutely. Like, jump, Jerry rig. So but it, it was, I mean, it was a good 10 feet tall. It was an impressive large ice cream. <clears throat> was it edible? It was not edible. So Chris, give us yes. 30 seconds. So I'm Chris Miller. Uh, I am not really in the winter sports industry. Uh, I work for Ben & Jerry's based in Burlington, Vermont, and I have uh, one of the more unique roles, I think, or, or positions in the corporate world. Uh, my title is activism manager. Uh, my job is to organize uh, sort of citizen and consumer engagement campaigns that are rooted in our company's progressive set of values. Our CEO likes to say my job is to piss people off. <laughs> Next. Kim, please. Greetings. Hi. Uh, I'm Kim Kupinis. I'm uh, one of the two founders of Golight. We're an outdoor brand, make apparel and, equi and equipment. Um, we're based in Boulder, Colorado. And I've just recently, within like the last eight months, taken on a role with the nonprofit called B Lab. And we're the ones behind the certified B Corporation. So Golight we're proud, has been a proud B Corp since 2008. So there's over 1,100 companies globally, a lot of companies you know and love, Patagonia and Ben and & Jerry's, um, some generation, and... Um, give us, give us 30 seconds on what a B Corp is, because this is a critical idea, and I'm not sure people are familiar with that. Yeah, the really simple elevator pitch version of it is that B Corps are better companies. They bake um, triple bottom line or stakeholder interest into their legal DNA. They are walking the talk. They're better from the standpoint of how they treat their employees. They give back more to the community. They tend to be minority women owned and, or employee owned. Um, they are doing a lot to reduce their environmental footprint. And they're just good global corporate citizens. Odd. Well, it's nice to be up here and see all you guys. I'm Chris Davenport. Um, I know most of you. I don't know you guys, though. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, I guess for, uh, for the sake of this conversation, I am a Protect Our Winners uh, board member, uh, long time, lifelong outdoor enthusiast, skier, um, and passionate uh, climate champion, I guess. Warrior. Warrior. Warrior and warrior. Yeah. So, we, I, I want to I start by uh, asking the, the most basic question. Why are we talking about activism? Why are we talking about social movements? A lot of what just preceded this presentation was, hey, you can do some things, some small things, and make progress. And that's really important. But I think there's a big question here, which is why, why social movement instead of just do some stuff? Why not just make recycled clothing? Why do you have to have a social movement? How come it always has to be such a pain in the butt to get anything done like this? Chris, can you start? Well, I guess my point of view on this is that, you know, we as a country, as a society, as a planet, we face some pretty big problems, right? So whether that's the issue of climate change, whether it's, you know, income inequality and the growing gap between the rich and the poor, there are a whole host of issues that we face that sort of threaten the stability and, and, and economy uh, of the world, and and I don't think we solve many of these problems. I'm sorry to say, with small individual actions. I think if you look at any of the major sort of changes uh, that we've seen over the course of history, from women's suffrage to the civil rights movement, it requires a movement of people who, frankly, kind of give a shit and are willing to, to do something about it. And, and I think, you know, particularly, I, I'm increasingly involved in the issue of climate change. 
Uh, and I think that's the only way we get to where we need to go on this issue of climate. Uh, I think, you know, we all need to take small steps in our lives. You know, we all need to live a little bit better, and we all need, you know, to, to operate our companies in a way that is, you know, attempting to reduce our footprint. But at the end of the day, there is no series of individual voluntary actions that solves this global problem of climate change. So we have to come together in a movement to put pressure on our leaders to solve the problem. So, and, and none of you should hesitate to interrupt the other, or me. Uh, but, Kim, you've approached this from the perspective of saying, we're gonna fix capitalism, Yep. right? I mean, mm -hmm. so, and that's about as big picture as it gets. What's the, um, how do you go about deciding what your, what your movement is based around? Well, I, I think Chris just p pointed out the huge range of in, intractable, pro intractable problems that we have caused as, as a civilization, as humanity. And, you know, the single largest force on the planet to fix that is business. And if we're not using business as a force for good or as a solution to these problems, then we're, we're fucked. Sorry. We're screwed. Um, first there have been two profanities, well two profanities in the first seven minutes of this. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, sign. you know, when I think about clim climate change specifically, but you can look at anything, depletion of resources, human trafficking, extinction of species, et cetera, et cetera. What is the root cause of those problems. Most of them have come about in the last hundred years, and it's industrial capitalism that led to those. I'm a big capitalist. I love capitalism, but it's, it's gone awry. And a lot of it is because um, the structure itself causes companies to do uh, egregious things, you know, to, in the name of profit. Part of it is shareholder primacy. When you look at kind of systemically what's wrong, corporations are required by law to maximize shareholder profit at the expense of other stake stakeholders. So how do we overturn that system? What can we do to change a system to say you should care about your employees, you should care about the community, you should care about the environment? Yes, you should care about your investors too, but they're a stakeholder like the others. Okay, so, go ahead. Can I just jump in really Please, briefly yeah. on that? I, this is incredibly important. It's not about blowing up capitalism. It's about providing guardrails and rules of the road. Let me give it just a really quick example. So many of you may know that Ben & Jerry's is owned by a rather large global multinational company called Unilever. Uh, they bring you everything from Lipton tea and Hellman's mayonnaise to Axe body spray. Um, you know, the company, Ben & Jerry's was bought in 2000, and I can tell you that the founders of the company did not want to sell to Unilever. The company was a, was a publicly traded company. The stock was going for something like 24 bucks a share. Unilever offered $42 a share. The board of directors, by law, could only consider shareholder return when they thought about the decision whether or not to accept the Unilever offer. They knew that that offer could lead to a whole host of negative impacts on other stakeholders, from workers at the corporate headquarters to the plant to where we, you know, sourcing all Vermont milk. But those kinds of additional external stakeholders could not be considered when they made the decision whether or not to sell a company. So that's why the B Corporation movement is so incredibly important. It gives directors of companies the ability to consider things other than just unendingly maximizing shareholder return. Yep. So, uh, Dav, a, a question for you. You were an athlete for years, and then, it might, and I could be wrong. What here, happened? But, but <laughs> 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 you, the snow car. started melting. <laughs> <laughs> what, you, like many uh, athletes, you got into activism into protect our winners and climate and that's actually true for a lot of professional athletes um, you know JP Eau Claire <coughs> tragically died last week but he was a guy coming to the end of his athletic career who was really thinking about how to improve the world through Alpine initiatives he was working on climate as well so there's this transition what well, talk to us a little bit about how you made that transition and also why you picked activism because one of the things that we're going to talk about a little later here is it's not, it's not easy to hang it out there because people get mad at you. And yeah. they, they can say, hey, just ski, dude, okay? I, I'm stop, gonna... stop talking about climate. So to answer your question, I first want to start off by um, sharing with you the kind of letter that I get maybe every day. Oh, cool. 
Okay, so this is from a gentleman. Uh, I get these two, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> who, says, who says, Chris, we have had at least seven major ice ages and then a period of warming not caused by coal-powered plants. A long time ago, all the science community figured out the world was flat and the Earth was in the center of the universe. And then about 40 years ago, where we were heading to another major ice age, that even made the cover of Time Magazine. My point is that we have been wrong in the past, but for some reason we can't be wrong about this. One small volcano emits more deadly CO2 in one eruption than man has in history, and you all think that we have the power to change the climate globally? If you believe this, then the ski industry is bigger hypocrites than Gore with his houses and private planes. The ski industry uses more energy than most heating large lodges and running lifts and cats and helicopters. I made sure to send him our methane capturing power plant data. <laughs> Chris Davenport, if you really believe this crap, you would not hop on a plane and ski all over the world. You would worry about your personal carbon footprint, which I do, but I'm sure if we follow the money trail, it leads to y'all getting paid well to spout this crap. And that's only, so, that's only the first half of the So let me tell you how much money Protect Our Winners pays me. You know no, you're doing so, something right if you get that email. The indicator, by the way, was the y'all, which yeah, means you tell where the person is from. Well, I actually I looked him up and found out that he owns a pipeline welding company. <laughs> Hey, you know what, he's, he's, we've had a very open, honest conversation back and forth on the internet, and he's entitled to his opinion, and I presented a lot of details and facts that I've learned over the years. But to answer your question, Auden, um, I didn't choose activism, it chose me, and it didn't, I, I always had it in me. I, I loved the outdoors since I was a child. My parents took me hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Uh, I was absolutely inspired by it all, and I, I found that that was sort of my happy place in life, and it continues to be, and it's really, really important to me. Uh, and I used, once, once I was successful as an athlete and, and had a voice, I decided that I'm going to use this voice for what I believe in, which is to do better, uh, to be a better, uh, more efficient human being on this planet. And so I, I found that activism sort of sought me out and the opportunity uh, came to me through my own successes in skiing. And I said, well, it, I would be remiss not to take advantage of this. Uh, because I think it's, a, I believe that it's really important and I seem to be surrounded by other people that share the same sentiment and our industry has this incredibly powerful opportunity if we can bring, every, bring everyone together and what really sort of tipped the, um, so turn the table for me. I was sitting, and you might have even been there, in uh, Senator Mark Udall's office in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, a uh, Democratic senator from Colorado. We were talking about these things, why climate's important. We were sharing facts about uh, how many dollars it brings to state coffers, the ski industry and snowboard industry and resorts and uh, all the, num the number of employees that these industries uh, support. And as we talked about this, he said, Chris, I I'm with you 100%. I believe in it. I believe in all of this. You know that I do. But if you want me to do something about it, make me do something about it. And the way to do that is to build a constituency, get a strong voice, come to me with hundreds of thousands of signatures, come to me with letters, you know, have people vote their consciousness, their conscience. And uh, when I heard him say that, I said, okay, well, here's my call to action. Now I'm really gonna ramp up my, um, my, my energy, or, or I guess my, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ramp up my involvement and, uh, and do more. And so that's why it's important to me, and I think uh, that's why Protect Our Winners is really working hard to bring all of you and all of the industry together so that we do have a strong collective voice and we can move the needle. Because as individuals, as we were talking about, it's, it's very difficult. You can do small things. Um, I know Maddie and Nicole presented a fantastic uh, concept for the Group Y, uh, the Group Y concept there, which is, I think, really good. So, yeah, that's where I stand right now. I mean, it's... Uh, if I post something on my Facebook page, if it, even if it's what I believe in and I'm passionate about it, as soon as it set, talks about climate, I get 10 times the amount of hate mail than I do positive responses. People feel really strongly about yeah, yeah. this stuff so, isn't happening. So let's, that, that's interesting to me, that question of... That I'm a hypocrite. No, yeah. Well, I, I mean, gosh. Come on in, the water's warm. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the question is, is, that, is there something there? I mean... Clearly, there's an e Chris got this email from uh, someone from Mississippi who wells pipelines who didn't agree with him and who's actually mad at him and called him a hypocrite. And it sounds like you engage this guy in a respectful conversation. Absolutely. And that's the whole point of social media. And just Chris, Chris Miller has some interesting commentary on this, but I've done this too in my daily raft of hate mail. And often it ends with someone saying, oh, I just wanted to talk to you, you know, or one, one particularly hateful conversation ended with me saying, hey, do you live in the Roaring Fork Valley? Yeah. 
you want to get coffee? Sure. So it's fascinating that these people don't hate you. But Chris, talk a little bit about social media, Ben and Jerry's. You know, we, look, we as a company have always been one that, that doesn't shy away from controversy. Often we, we sort of steer into it. Uh, and, and when we do, it generates buzz on social media. Uh, you know, we, we tend to typically post uh, on social media channels sort of uh, roughly a 70-30 sort of mix. 70% of our, our posts are focused on what we call ice cream porn, right? It's shot, <laughs> lovely shots of ice cream. Uh, and and those posts perform incredibly well. We have a bit. We have over uh, we, just south of eight million Facebook fans. We've got you know big following on on Twitter, Instagram, uh, and other social media channels. But but about thirty percent of our our posts are focused on posts that are kind of rooted in our values. Everything from the work we've been doing over the last year around mandatory GMO labeling to marriage equality and climate change. And you know these are controversial issues. But what we find is that haters are going to hate, right? There are always going to be people who sort of disagree with our point of view on something. But the magic of, of, of sort of social media is that so often we don't even have to defend our point of view. Our fans and followers defend us. And so it's this incredible conversation that happens amongst our fans with, you know, often our fans coming to our defense. Uh, you know, we also know uh, that, that consumers who are our fans, our consumers who are aware of the work that we do, our issue advocacy campaigning, our progressive social values, they're two and a half times more loyal to our brand than the average consumer, right? And that's gold. Those are consumers who are not going to jump to uh, haagen when they get a coupon for haagen They're going to buy Ben & Jerry's because they believe in the product, they believe in the brand. The final thing I'll just say is, uh, you know, for companies, for brands, and I, you know, I assume this is true for athletes as well, you don't need everyone in the world to love you. you know, we are the number one super premium ice cream brand in the United States, and something like 7% of consumers, 7% of the American public is responsible for about 70% of our sales. So we can afford people who you know, weld pipelines and wherever, to, to not be happy with our point of view. Because every person that's unhappy with our position on something, there are two, three, four that become far more passionate about our company, our brand, and the work we do. Kim, do you have something on that? Yeah, I just, I love what you just said, Chris. I think um, the difference between us is you have how many Facebook followers? <laughs> just a little less than 8 million. I think we have 30,000. <laughs> you know, so we're a challenger brand. and. We have very strong values. Our, are you our, talking about Go Light? Go Light, sorry. Go Light, Go Light was, you know, was founded on the notion that if people go into the outdoors, they can connect with nature more fully if they, they don't carry the kitchen sink with them. And so we spent a lot of time get, you know, on our kind of causes are getting people outdoors, especially young people and conservation efforts, trying to uh, make sure that our wilderness pres is preserved. The few times we've gone into the foray of talking actively about climate change, our haters are really loud and like vocal and present on our social media space. And so with only 30,000 followers, it seems to like, it feels like it takes over the social media space. So I just wonder if it's, you know, having a big company, you, can start, you have a little more flexibility on that. But I will completely agree with you that you can't be plain vanilla. You know, your most loyal customers will come to you and stay with you when you are just unabashed about who you are and what you care about. And they're part, and then they're part of your tribe. So let's get out a little bit of how do you talk about an issue that is controversial, like in, 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 with Ben and Jerry's, it's GMOs, Chris, it's climate change. Uh, you're talking about capitalism yeah, and, and redoing the that. Yeah. That's problematic for some people. Very uh, much how so. do you talk about it in a way that doesn't uh, piss people off? Chris? I like to talk about it as a, a non-issue. It's not an issue. It certainly shouldn't be a political issue. It has economic ramifications, but it's our home. It's our planet. It's where we live. Why is it an issue that people have opinions about? We should all agree that a healthy environment equals healthy lives, equals good economy. We, and these are, I don't understand how people even have a, opinions on these things. Okay, when you, stuck, when you talk about climate change, for whatever reason, that is polarizing. 
but when we talk about a healthy planet or healthy bodies, everybody that's agrees right. that's a good thing. So I like to try to avoid the, the climate change um, angle and focus more on like what we can do as humans to be more efficient, to be, uh, have a l lower carbon footprint, to walk the earth you know, with, with smaller shoes, if you will. Um, and I find that, and we were talking about this in our group earlier, uh, if, you, if you sort of focus the discussion there, you can deflect a lot of that, uh, a lot of those haters and, and really get down to what matters, which is, yeah, be, being more efficient and using less uh, carbon intense energy and things like that, things that are important to us. I mean, again, th this isn't gonna change overnight. It's not gonna change within our generation, but as a parent, I wanna leave my children with a better planet than I live on, or perhaps at least an opportunity to have a better planet than I live on. I feel like it's our responsibility to do so. So I take that seriously, and that's, I just, in the thinking about it, it's not an issue, it's, it's who we are as a human race on the planet. Hold that thought, Kim, I got one follow-up. How many emails do you get from people who like what you're doing on activism? Well, like, like, like Chris was saying, the ratio is always uh, much more in the side of the haters. Um, people that agree don't always come out and say they agree. I mean, I have a lot of social media followers, and sometimes they'll say, hey, great, good for you. We love what you were right. doing. But more, than, more often than not, you'll have people with differing opinions voicing them. Right, right. And that's life, as you all know. No one ever says, good job, or very rarely. You rarely get patted on the back, but you get attacked a lot. More people so, should do that, though. Yes, all of you. You're doing a good job that. right now. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's one of the things we talked about and kind of prep for this panel is that I think that, you know, on these issues that tend to be divisive, we really need to use language that um, is unifying. You know, yeah. if you look at the last decade and see how far gay rights have come, it's a lot of it is because they're, the PR machine behind them, it was a group of leaders that really thought, gave careful thought to how they were going to communicate this message, which is, which was around themes that everybody could agree on. Yeah, freedom of choice, freedom. You know, we're, we're a country about freedom. It's about family and love, letting people love who they, who they want to love, you know. And, um, you know, in the climate change debate, it's become hung up in all kinds of, like, non nonsense partisan mm -hmm. junk, you know, uh, d debating the science of it instead of, like, focusing on, what are we really talking about here? Let's stop being reliant on other people's non-renewable energy. Yep. Let's stop sending our kids over there to die, yep. to fight over this, you know? I mean, there's some themes that I think we could, like, rally around, both, like, ends of the ridiculous spectrum that exists could rally around and, and really move, stop the haranguing and so we could actually make progress to solve the, this issue. I think we as, a, as an outdoor industry, yeah. the go lights of the world, the Aspen skiing companies of the world, the athletes, everybody that's in the outdoor industry can do so t together collectively and really have much bigger totally impact agree. than we as maybe individuals with our little Facebook pages. Totally agree. Question in the back. Yes, good. I think it's awesome that <laughs> well, this is a, Tom, it's exactly what I was about to say, and you should keep the rebel facial hair, by the way. You know, that would give uh, more street cred. The, uh, the question I was going to say is, if you do always pursue common ground, and you say, oh, let's do energy efficiency, and let's keep, let's not have our boys in Iraq, let's be fuel independent, I worry you don't get, to your point, Tom, far enough. Climate change is a problem that is a threat to civilization. On the track, Chris and I were talking about this before the meeting, on the track we're headed today, we're gonna warm five to seven degrees C by 2100. All your businesses go away. All your grandchildren are in deep trouble. And because the, that little temperature swing was what, in the opposite direction, was what covered North America with a mile thick sheet of ice. So we gotta do radical stuff. We gotta cut emissions 80%, not just get off foreign oil. So Chris, you're a revolutionary. What do you have to say about that? I, I, I tend to agree. I think there are incredibly powerful and wealthy, but, but very narrow interests that are trying to keep us where we are on this issue of climate change. I think, you know, this is, this is technology from the 19th century. It's, in some ways, it's, it's, you know, all of us with smartphones, the fact that, that we power those smartphones by burning rocks that boil water that turn a turbine, it, it's almost mind-boggling, 
right? And, and, and so there's a whole future that's cleaner, that's greener, that creates jobs, that creates economic growth. What we're not talking about here is, is you know, a future where we're all, you know, sitting in cold, dark rooms in sweaters. You know, the future is the Tesla, right? The Tesla is not a smart car. It's a kick-ass, fast car, best car ever rated by Consumer Reports, and it has emits no CO2. It doesn't require fossil fuels. So the, the, the future is technologically advanced. It's, it, it's, it can be a really positive vision for the future, but there are incredibly powerful forces that are going to go, you know, going to fight to the end to keep pumping oil and coal out of the ground. So I do think, you know, I, I do think we have to continue to have that, that kind of radical edge. Uh, let me just quickly say on these, on these issues, I think as, as companies, as athletes, when you take on these issues, when you talk about these issues, you need to be transparent, right? Ben & Jerry's has a big carbon footprint. We, it's two pounds per pint. We're a dairy company. Cows fart and burp and emit huge amounts of methane. We make ice cream in Vermont, and we put it on a ship, and we sell it in Australia. So we don't believe that we have to have everything sorted out before we step out and say, our world leaders need to step up on this issue. So we need, you know, we need to do, we need to have a plan. Aspen does great work on efficiency and renewables, and we're working hard too. There's nothing we can do on our own to solve this problem. So we're going to do what we can within our supply chain and business, but but we don't feel we need to be perfect in order to take a point of view on this. So you know, always be transparent. I think that's, that's important. And then also work with external stakeholders. It's something that typically corporations like mine don't do particularly well. When we're developing a marketing strategy, we don't shop it around to, you know, our competitors and others. You know, it's a really sort of closed internal process. But when we develop a, a, a climate campaign, we're talking to all the groups on the space. We're not issue experts. We, we sort of lean on NGOs and others to be our sort of, you know, our, uh, the, the sort of issue experts. To your point, we're not scientists, we're kind of ice cream people, but, um, you know, so I think be transparent, reach out, work with, with external stakeholders to help you uh, uh, be able to be out in public and take a position on issues. Yeah, no. I don't know. So I, I really respect your point, and I totally agree. We need both the radical voices. We need people yelling at the system, saying there's, it's screwed up and it needs to be fixed. And we need like the massive center of companies, especially big companies, choosing to do business in a better way and shift, shifting how they do business. One of the most th important things this, the ski industry can do is work collectively, is start having a group of people that talks about the fact that our winners are at risk, you know, and that, that the industry collectively can do a lot to yell at Washington, D.C., to collectively reduce your environmental footprint, to help teach each other how you're doing that. There's already a movement that's been afoot in the outdoor industry for about six years that a number of ski brands are already a part of. And there's a group called the Sustainability Working Group and the HIG Index, and they're working really hard to give the tools and the knowledge to product designers to, at a micro level, reduce their environmental footprint. Now, is it perfect? No, but is it a great, leap in the right direction for an industry to be working pre-competitively to say, yeah, I know you're my competitor, and we're trying to get that same space on that retail store shelf, but hell, we care about the same thing here. We'd like to have an, an outdoor industry, uh, wilderness and outdoor spaces to go to in 100 years, don't you think? And so they're working hard to, 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 to try and say, you know, we as an industry are, have a much more powerful voice collectively than we do as single brands. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Go ahead. I just, you know, when I look at what you guys did with the methane plant here, it's really, it's a beautiful story that I think needs to be told better across the country because, A, you're offsetting carbon, tons of carbon. It just naturally will flow. But you wouldn't have done it if it didn't make financial sense. And this is where, Cam, your point of sort of being in the middle ground, yes, we need rebels, yes, we need non-rebels. And this is where I think you guys were genius and, and with no disrespect meant, can get the story out better because it paints a corporate picture of environmental responsibility with fiduciary responsibilities yeah. also at the same time. And that's crucial. Oh, wow. crucial. Yes. Uh, I, I, Dave, you want to respond? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 
Uh, we had a national ad campaign uh, the segment of Warren Brown movie. You could not use the internet for like four weeks without seeing a fan of that. It's written up in almost every single magazine that gives a shit about skiing. Uh, Third profanity. The team is still talking about it. It's, um, it's a story that has kind of evolved even after, you know, the wheel started first. Um, what, I, what I want to know is... Uh, Exactly this wonderful story you guys have. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he owns the, the coal. He owns the coal mine. <laughs> Just so you guys know, what we're talking about we did a uh, 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 we partnered with a coal mine owned by Bill Koch, who hasn't been super progressive on climate <laughs> and, uh, or his family, and uh, we're making clean electricity equal to the entire resort. I, I mean, my quick comment is I think the story has legs and hasn't even begun to take off. Right. I have another comment on that, but Chris has something. Well, I was just going to challenge um, Chris at Ben & Jerry's to hook up the million cows to the methane capturing system and start generating some power. We are installing digesters on our family farms. That's Sweet. one approach we're taking. And what's interesting is the same cow power. technology. Nice, cow power. So, but, but to your point, this gets at something that, that kind of goes back to the beginning of this conversation, which is, okay, that's an operational change that we did, it has return on investment, but if we're going to solve climate change, we're going to have to do a lot of stuff that isn't as easy as that was, even though that was brutally difficult and took two and a half years. It's going to require CEOs getting out and talking about climate change. That really hasn't happened. It's going to take athletes more than we already have hanging it out like Chris is hanging out. It's going to take corporations like Ben & Jerry's, which has a a climate push coming in 2015 around the Paris conferences, the whole company's dedicating itself to climate, but nobody else is. Again, we were talking earlier and I was saying, you're the only company out there. I mean, I, I think it's a great story and, and I think these stories need to be told, but I think to Auden's point, there is not going to be an ROI on everything we need to do to solve this problem. What I can tell you is, that, that the investments that will be needed to solve this problem are much smaller than the investments that will be needed to, to adapt to five, six, seven mm. degrees C, right? On an order of magnitude. That doesn't mean that every, everything we need to do is gonna have a short-term ROI. I mean, it sort of goes back to the, the kind of B Corp case here, you know, public companies are just driven by quarterly reporting, right? And so it makes it really difficult to look at anything that has a payoff that's not fairly short in nature. So I think we, we have to tell those stories, but we can't give people the impression that, hey, it's a win, 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 win all the time. We're gonna, you're gonna save money, you're gonna save the planet, you're gonna, you know, this is gonna take some things. It's likely gonna mean the cost of energy is going to increase, but as we increase the cost of energy, we're gonna become more efficient in the way we use it. So, you know, I think all of that. And then here's my big pitch for the room here, which is you guys, we can't get to where we need to go on this issue or many others without you guys. You know, before I worked at Ben & Jerry's, I worked at Greenpeace. I ran the global warming campaign in the US. I hung activists off of power plants uh, and banners, and, uh, and it was one of the best jobs ever. But I will tell you that you guys are a lot cooler than, you know, hippie Greenpeace activists. That, that you guys have the ability, and companies like mine have the ability to connect with the right kinds of people on this issue in a way that others can't. And so you guys can really be a part of, of a, a, a sort of inflection point in, in how we tackle these issues. You guys are storytellers. You're compelling athletes. You're brands that people love and admire. Uh, you know, my parent company can convince teenage boys to buy Axe deodorant. I mean, certainly we could use some of that sort of incredibly smart marketing power to, to, to engage people on why this and other issues matter. So this, this is, you know, you guys. Chris, I would expand on that just by saying to all of you that 
that our industry, the underlying emotion that drives business in our industry is passion. People are passionate about skiing and snowboarding and winter sports. It is awesome. It is the business of fun. It rules. Let's use that same energy and passion to do what feels right and what is right and move the needle when it comes to climate change. Or let's not say climate change. Yeah, issues, living efficiently, being, being more energy efficient, those types of things. Why not use that sh same passion that we, that we share or that we use out in the mountains for, for these issues that are important to us? And, and people want that. They don't just want adrenaline, they want meaning. I'm, I'm arguing. Yeah, and purpose. Purpose. Yeah, purpose. What if, there are, Amanda. So I think. Well, Amanda, if you get a clipboard, I'll send everyone over there that's not signed up as a member of Protect Our Winners. And <laughs> that's right. Sweet. Jeremy Jones party, oh, so Aspen Brewing Company, four to six. Aspen Brewing Company, this is an opportunity to really have fun and do something good. So, uh, and it's free beer, but you have to give a contribution. But if you give less than you're going to drink, then it adds up. Uh, <laughs> can, there, I, yeah. can I, can I ask can that? Well, we kicked it on a little bit, but I work for Clock, and I feel like I'm, you know, our brand is similar to a lot of what we do in this room. And, you know, we manufacture all over the world. We have containers 20 at a time shipping all over the world. We talk a lot about how can we reduce our carbon footprint and the things that we don't really have control over are the biggest and most frustrating things. Um, so I guess I ask you guys, what should our call to action be to our consumers, our fans, so that we can start making a difference? All, if, all of, if we just talk about it, we just talk about it, nothing happens, we're not going to revolutionize the shipping from Asia and then you know, maybe yeah. Amazon's going to start this drone thing. But I'm asking, what can we do to start people getting active here because 70% of our global footprint, we don't individually have the power to change. I travel 100,000 <laughs> miles a year with United. I can't not travel. How are we going to get United to fly a more efficient airplane? Yeah. So that's a, that's a, those are those are lots of questions embedded in there, and I'll tell you first, from a consumer standpoint, use your marketing communications platform, your, your bully pulpit, to start encouraging your consumers to make better choices when they spend their dollars, to get involved and in, in protect our winners, to get involved in other efforts to get real climate change legislation through in Washington. From a, from a company standpoint, the most important thing you can do is get your own house in order. You know, figure out, how, figure out what your footprint is. Where are your largest footprints? impacts from a greenhouse gas, gas standpoint. Figuring out whether or not you really do need to make all those flights to Asia. But my guess is if you make things, most of your footprint is in the stuff that you make. So figuring out how to reduce the, the footprint of the materials that go into your products. All of that, you, you can go down that path by, there's tons of companies in the, the outdoor and the, and the, the uh, sporting goods space that are doing really good work already and they're willing to share that information. In the B Corp community, there's a book that just came out called the B Corp Handbook. It's kind of a guideline for how companies can do business in a better way. If you go to bcorporation.net, there's an online assessment called the B Impact Assessment. It's a free online tool for any company in the world. Over 18,000 companies have taken this assessment. You don't have to become a B Corp. It'll give you all basically a, a roadmap for how you can improve your footprint across the full spectrum of sustainability, not just environment, which is really important for all the reasons we've just talked about, but how are you treating your employees? Are you giving back to the community? How are you, what are your governance practices like? Do you share ownership with your employees, et cetera? Let me uh, interject there. The question you ask is the this essential question asked by corporations when they want to do something good. They say, oh, but we're not that good. And here's the deal. If you eliminated your carbon footprint entirely, it wouldn't matter. So, which isn't to say you shouldn't try, but if your CEO goes to Washington or writes an op-ed and says, I'm a business person, we have to solve climate change, there are bipartisan ways to do it, it will do more than anything you could ever do in your overseas shipping. And people have to get that understanding that it's voice, it's your marketing message, it's your customer, and you're going to do the best you can, but ultimately what you're going to say is, 
Are we hypocrites? Yes. Do we use a lot of energy? Yes. But so does the whole world. And are we trying to get better? Yes. Yeah. Is there uh, other? Yeah. For uh, your panelists, who do you think is getting the message out there in a proper way? If you go around and you look at your day-to-day -day activities, is there somebody who is doing it right? Auden Schendler? Is doing it right. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Consistent <laughs> message. I always look fishing for. On climate change specifically, <coughs> there's a lot of really good companies doing hard work in this area. Yeah, the whole community B Corps. I would say that at least 30 percent of them are vocal, are loud and out there on this issue. What, no. And there's a group called Bicep. Is anybody familiar with Bicep? Mm -hmm. That's work. At a group of companies from par partially from our space includes Nike and Timberland that are working for climate change. So is your question who's who's messaging on climate best? Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you had to go, I mean, we've talked collectively, everybody's pretty much in agreement here with what we want to do, we're passionate about it, but if you go out and look in the regular business standpoint, who else is telling a good story that Very few. you pick up an idea from? Very few. I mean, I think, I think that we all have to kind of step up our game here. I think companies like Patagonia have been willing to take on issues like the tar sands, right? I mean, that's an issue that most companies don't want to touch. I mean, we have to get we have to get out there and be more more political on this issue. That doesn't mean being partisan. I'm not you know, we are we are a fiercely nonpartisan in the kinds of work we do, but to be sure, this is a political issue. This is this this is an issue that requires political solutions and it requires all of us becoming political. So, I think the quick answer is most Companies are risk averse. Most companies and, and people don't want to get political because they don't see any downside. Let me tell put a really quick story this will be here. The last word and we're done. It's, are, are we done? Are we oh, getting the hook? Yeah, go ahead. I can shut it down. No, go, go. We we took on a campaign in Australia around the Great Barrier Reef. There's this plan to expand uh, coal ports on the eastern side of Australia to export coal to China. Threatening the Great Barrier Reef, they were going to dredge and dump the dredge waste into the Great Barrier Reef Marine Reserve. Stupid on its face, and ironically, the biggest threat to the reef is climate change, right? It's ocean warming and acidification. So here they're going to dump this waste to expand the coal ports. It's going to expand more coal, blah, blah, blah. Our company, uh, when, when we went into Queensland where these, these ports are being expanded, the, the environment minister there came at us and said, what is this American company doing telling us not to expand these coal ports and, and dredge the reef? And uh, he called us a bunch of yanks and called for a boycott on the company. I can tell you our Unilever people in Australia were beside themselves. I mean, they thought this was the end of the world and it was going to be de the destruction of the business. It was an incredible boon to our company and brand, which we didn't necessarily you know, anticipate. But I mean, there was a poll in the Melbourne Times that showed 87% of, of people polled were more likely to buy Ben & Jerry's because of our position on this. And they took the environment minister to task for it. So we need to get more courage. We need to step up. So quick note here, just let me add that there's an opportunity there. And to your point, how many CEOs in the US have, have written an op-ed saying we have to act on climate? One, it's Unilever, one. So there's a business niche that most people care about right open to you. Last comment and then we're done. I will, before you finish, you guys should use this group as a resource. Chris is a world expert on this, so is Kim and, and, and in sports, uh, Chris. Email them. <laughs> email them. Contact them. In, yes. In don't email me. Please. Or don't send them hate mail. Last comment. If you really care about this, you know, I think Chris just pointed out, and Chris just pointed out all the ways you can be vocal and be a, a vocal um, proponent at the macro level. But try and get your own house in order. Figure out what you can do within your company to start a green team, to start a sustainability team. Look at your footprint. When Golay did our greenhouse gas fo footprint for the first time, we discovered that, the, that more than two-thirds of our greenhouse gases were in the product, the materials that went into our products. Within a two-year span, we went from 6% environmentally preferred materials, meaning like recycled nylons and polyesters, to more than two-thirds of the mass of our materials, environmentally preferred materials. 70% reduction in the, in the footprint of those products because of some careful work that we did with our product teams. You guys can do it. Do that, but it's not enough. Then you have to speak about climate. So operational greening, then talk politically. Thank you, everybody.